The aim of every artist, wrote William Faulkner, is to arrest motion, which is life, and hold it fixed. So that a hundred years later, when a stranger looks at it, it moves again. This is the story of such an artist. Summer in the North Woods. The air is sweet with the smell of pine and green growing things. And somewhere in that island of sticks and mud is the next painting of Martin Glenn Lotes. It's a kind of painting that begins with waiting. Patience before the brush. No waiting for some subjects, though. Just find them. And for as long as the blooming, they'll pose. The color, the texture, the composition, it's already there. Even the setting. Wildflowers seem to lose none of their life, no matter where they grow. But a beaver does. Take him from here and the wildness is gone. So here's where he must be seen, even if it's only for an instant. It's a kind of painting that begins with waiting. And baiting. When you're an artist with too many subjects, you cut one out from the flock and watch its every move. The way it lands and runs and struts and turns, it cocks its head and puzzles over such generosity in the off season. The way it soars and glides and rides the summer air, Pick one pose, one instant in time. Then try to remember it long enough to sketch. And make a lot of them. One may become a painting. You've been studying birds since you were eight. You painted them at 14. You almost know their every move and mood by memory. Yet still you hide and you stare. And you search for something different in the way they fly. And run for cover. In the way they curl around a thistle. Or balance on a bainberry bush. The way they scream and fan and ruffle their plumage. You watch them in fear, in anger and in pursuit, 
you make quick color studies of eyes and bills and feathers and feet. Later, you'll pour over field guides and museum stuffings. But only in life will the colors be genuine. Then you collect window dressings, props and backdrops, settings and terrains, merely supporting characters in the drama, but they're researched with the same meticulous care that's devoted to the star. Finally, you take a stroll through Ardwood Bush in the early morning to watch how berries drip from their stems. And in the bill of a waxwing. Then, then you paint. Glenn's first Canadian postage stamp was a gray jay. Now the thrushes and a white-throated sparrow. The gentle songbirds, they're the favorites. There's violence in nature, too. So you paint the hunters and the hunted, the predators and the prey. is to arrest motion, which is life, and hold it fixed, so that a hundred years later, when a stranger looks at it, it moves again. A kingfisher breaks the water, scattering feathers and fins in the same painting. And for one terrifying moment, a rainbow trout turns pale. When it dies, it'll lose nearly all of its color. That's why fish have to be painted from life. And that's where Bernie comes in. Glenn Lotes has three brothers, all of them artists. Bernie, his scuba diving twin, is a technical illustrator whose descriptions and underwater photographs transport Glenn into a world he's never seen himself, but through paint.
1010 on your dial, Ontario's authoritative news voice. Good morning, this is Henry Shannon again of the CFRB jet helicopter looking at southbound parkway traffic. Now there's a car to the right of the road just south of the Don Mills Road overpass. And the traffic is backed up from that point right back to Eglinton. And it's also slow from York Mills until you get to Eglinton. So we'll stay all the way down from York Mills Road until you get down past the Don Mills Road overpass. It's busy going. And beyond that point... Every spring, a starling builds its home in that concrete post. A few blocks away in the trees of a cemetery are the birds of a dozen species. And in those great empty fields beside any highway, nature goes berserk for those with the eyes to see. The full treatment right now as we take a look at southbound Keel and we've just come across a two-car accident at Grace Field. Now that's just a couple of blocks north of Lawrence, south on Keel, and the southbound traffic is a mess. It's backed right up to Wilson Avenue. So I would avoid southbound Keel at the moment. South on the parkway, we have that stall car to the right of the road, south of the Don Mills Road overpass, and that traffic is packed all the way up to York Mills Road. It's also busy on the Gardner by the exhibition grounds, and your town roads are a little busier because of that computer out of whack this morning. Okay, Wally, back to you. Oh, boy, when Henry says it's... Beside a single milkweed, life begins, blossoms, dies, and is born again. And when winter comes, you put away your oranges and bring out the blues. Winter is wondering how such stillness can be so alive, and how anything so white can come out of a tube. But you paint it anyway and hope it won't look too much like cotton candy. Winter is signing your name to your own Christmas card and collecting a landing pad for a springtime bird. It's cleaning brushes in ice water and sketching foot-deep holes for an animated chisel that can beat its head against wood 20 times a second. National Magazine has commissioned Glenn to do a series of five big game mammals. This will be the first. The second was painted in winter, but born in the spring. And like most wildlife art, quite unexpectedly. gone, with not a trace and hardly a sketch. But the seedling of an idea was there, and sometimes a seedling's all you need to grow a picture. 
One quick look. One blurred photograph. here, just complacency. But this one must come from a cage. So you imagine how it might have looked. Fierce and wild and free. A graceful and sinuous cat weighing up to 200 pounds and pulling down 1,000 pound elks with ease. Now it seems stuffed and lifeless. So in your painting, you put the wildness back. And with the cougar, just one big game mammal to go, the biggest of the lot. And with any luck at all, he'll be painted from life. Destination, Ursus Horribilis, the horrible bear. Glenn's painted him before, but always in zoos. This time it'll be different, on a two-week vacation in the Pacific heart of grizzly country, where the dark green silence is only occasionally broken by the bite of an axe or the falling of a pine cone. An artist's paradise with life and color and backdrops enough for a hundred paintings. Fireweed for a bluebird. Alpine flowers for arctic butterflies. Lichen-covered meadows for caribou. Snow-capped mountains for goat and sheep. And the skies above them for eagles. And in those wild, clear blues that are only mixed in the heart of glaciers are the settings for grayling, steelhead, sockeye, and lake trout. When you're a young wildlife painter, only enough time and money for a few days in such a place, you take in every sight as if it's your last. And some you record. Just for proof. the tide into grizzly country. When the salmon swarm up river to lay their autumn eggs, a hungry bear can't be far behind. So at every bend you look for tracks and fur and claw marks and bones and see nothing but deer. So you push further 
and higher. Six days left. Scour the mountains and the berry patches. Four days. Buzz the sandbars. Three days and success. Ursus horribilis, full-grown, weighs 800 pounds, stands 8 feet tall, runs 30 miles an hour, and can carry a 200-pound deer under one arm. What a time to think of that. But you track him anyway. And a primeval tangle of moss and thorns drives you back to the beach. So you wait for him. Dawn to dusk, you wait. Two days left. If there's such a thing as a haunted place, this one's haunted. One day. If only we'd arrived sooner, if only you could stay longer, if only left some bait. If only... Mister? Oh, I'm drawing light in eyes. You can't see it now, but it was there once. And I'm drawing wildness. If you look hard, you can still see it. It's easier this time. You've been there. You've touched his claw marks on timber falls and been up before dawn in the mountain mist. Will you imagine him as fierce and as wild and as free as the country? Then, with a skin from the museum, you color him living. Wildness is the preservation of the world, wrote Henry Thaw. The city's imported at any price. Men plow and sail for it. From the forests and wilderness come the tonics and barks which brace mankind. 
Where the air is sweet with the smell of pine and green growing things. Where Martin Glenn Lotes has come in search of a subject. It's a kind of painting that begins with waiting and beaming and listening for nature's gurgles and growls and hisses and rattles, and chirps and thumps and crackles and squawks, for buzzes and yaps and snarls and hoots and splashes. like it did in your history book when you were a kid, remember? You planted beans in berry boxes, hatched cocoons on windowsills, and slid down mud banks in search of muskrat. Then the world got caught up in an age of speed, an age of things, and almost lost the smell of wood and the sound of wind shredded through needles. But out here, it all comes back. Out here, you're still a kid doing what you love the most, and feeling just a little like the wild and the free that you paint. <laughs> 